The idea that graphics and sound add value to video games by way of their aesthetic appeal or ability to evoke feelings and thoughts is pretty well accepted. It's no different from the way films make use of the same. In this video, I will first attempt to demonstrate this and then connect it to another more deep-seated argument for their value. The argument that they are not separate from gameplay, but are facets of it and thus are important to it. First, let's use an example to show just how useful visual cues can be, even in the absence of gameplay. Look at these two boxes and tell me which one is moving, relative to the background. Most people would say the box on the right. Others would say I was trying to trick you to illustrate a point. Both would be right. When we change the background, we can see that both boxes are moving. If we switch to a single stationary camera, it's even more obvious. But let's go back to split screen for now. What I want to illustrate with this example is that even though both boxes are moving in the exact same way, the box on the right communicates its movement much more effectively through a variety of purely visual effects. It faces the direction it's going, it creates particles as it moves, it leaves a trail behind it, and it leans forward and squints its eye as if it's straining itself. Almost as if it's a character. Not only that, but the camera tends to lag behind a little, as opposed to how perfectly the left box is followed. These things serve as visual indicators of movement, in addition to making the screen much more interesting to look at. You can also see the value in this by looking at existing games. Racing games are very good at conveying a sense of speed. Games involving combat use a variety of audiovisual effects to make the hit seem harder. Most games that you play make use of it in many, many ways, and it helps. For example, Fallout is a game I really enjoy, but it's very lacking in the tactical depth that is usually necessary to make turn-based combat engaging. However, this issue with the gameplay is mitigated by the simple fact that shooting things feels fun. The weapons sound powerful, you can knock enemies down, and critical hits can result in blowing your enemies to pieces. It allows the player to feel that they are able to impose their will on the game world in a powerful way, and this is enjoyable. It's a different kind of entertainment than the tactical combat of XCOM, but it still adds value to the game. The entertainment comes from how the visuals and audio can be used to convey information to the player, which is something that all video games need to do. Pushing buttons so that nothing happens on a blank screen isn't very fun. Text is easy to implement, but through visual feedback, the information can be more effectively communicated to a greater amount of people. After all, it's a lot easier to show someone a picture than to describe it in words. This applies just as well to audio and can be used concurrently with the visuals to provide more converging lines of data and create a more cohesive experience. You can see this from the 1997 experiment by Sekuler and others. They showed participants two objects that looked like they were passing through each other. Then they added a sound in the middle. This caused people to perceive the objects to be bouncing off of each other instead of passing through, even though the graphic representation was the exact same. This means that player perception can be affected powerfully by a combination of sound and graphics. The sense pleasure that enhances entertainment value in video games actually boils down to the communication of information about the game to the player. Which leads me to my next point. The role of feedback in gameplay. If we model a very simple game like Solitaire, not the computer game, but the physical card game, we can see a player and a game state. The player perceives information about the game state processes this information to determine their course of action, and the action causes a change in the game state, and the cycle continues. Before we go on, I would like to mention that this is not a flowchart. It looks like one, but the processes can happen continuously. They're not normally step by step, it's just easier to go over them that way. So let's complicate the model a little by adding a computer intermediary. A real live video game still has the game state, the player, the actions, and the perceptions, but there's more. Actions happen through input methods like controllers or keyboards, which the computer can understand. Then the computer changes the game state based on the player's input, takes information about it, and sends that information to output devices like the screen or the speakers. The computer also serves as a game manager, and can affect the game state outside of the player's actions. For example, it can control enemy characters. But going back to the model, the output is in a form understandable by the player which allows them to process more information and make better actions. Already you can see the importance of audio and visuals to the gameplay. After all, the output methods used to inform the player about the game state are an important part of the gameplay, and they typically give output in visual or auditory form. Those are just the easiest ways to deliver detailed information that we have right now. They could use some other kind of feedback mechanism like tactile, but we don't really have accessible and precise ways of producing that kind of sensation. 
Now, the intermediary doesn't have to be a computer, it can be a human being as well, kind of like a dungeon master in a pen and paper RPG. So let's consider Solitaire again, except this time the player acts through an intermediary, using their voice and language to give orders. The intermediary is the one directly interacting with and observing the game state, and gives information about the game to the player through vocal descriptions. This already sounds like a very annoying way to play Solitaire, probably because the control and feedback are both kind of awful. But what if we change the feedback? Instead of vocal descriptions of the game board, the player gets a live video feed of the cards. Not only does that make it easier to perceive the game state as expected, it also facilitates more finely graded controls. Instead of saying, move the eight of clubs to the second pile from the left, the player can now accurately direct the position of the cards in real time. For instance, pick up the eight of clubs, move it left, keep going, keep going, stop, okay, put it down. This is not because the control method has improved, but because more and better information about the game allows the player to make finer use of the controls. This shows that these parts of a game are not easily separable. Instead, they're strongly interconnected, and when we talk about gameplay, we have to consider the whole thing. And in a video game, that includes the graphics and sound. It also means that the common proposition that gameplay is of value in a video game but the visuals are not, is a very hard sell because the visuals are a part of the gameplay. Some of you might be thinking, but Ferris, feedback and fidelity are two different things. One refers to the communication of information to the player, whereas the other refers only to the detail of the art assets. Even if the former is important, the latter might not be. After all, what use are high resolution textures when you can just have the character lean forward a little as a visual indicator? Well, that distinction overlooks a crucial point. Details afford feedback. Even though the player doesn't notice every image or sound effect individually, these things converge together to impress upon the player's mental processing by way of their senses. That is, higher fidelity allows for more and better ways to inform the player about the game state. Going back to the boxes, what happens if we take away the right box's eye? Aside from losing a bit of personality, it's harder to tell which direction it's facing and what exactly it's doing. The squinting of the eye during movement and the widening of the eye when it comes to a rapid halt gives us another stream of converging data that tells us what's going on. Details like the eye serve as avenues through which the game can provide feedback to the player. So if the feedback is important, it stands to reason that so is fidelity. This can be seen in actual video games as well. All the exciting stuff that happens during a car crash and burnout makes it that much more chaotic and fun. It wouldn't be possible to do as much and communicate as effectively using only an 8-bit car sprite, for example. For a game where half the fun comes from destroying your vehicle in a variety of ways, the graphical detail allows the crashes to have as much impact as possible. Note that I'm not saying that more is necessarily better when it comes to feedback. Hiding major information from the player can be a deliberate design choice. For instance, card games like Hearthstone hide information about the opponent's hand, the contents of their deck, and the orders of the decks. But outside of the restrictions imposed by the game's rules for the purposes of entertainment, it's a good idea to convey information in as understandable and evocative a manner as possible. Going back to Hearthstone, the board is visible at all times, and the designers make good use of it. Creature tokens drop down from above as if they have actual physical weight. The spells have varied sounds and animations. Powerful hits have a bigger delay and cause a cheer when they strike. These things don't interfere with the game's rules, but add a lot of character by conveying information through various different means. So in summary, graphics and sound provide value by way of their role as feedback media. They act as the facets of gameplay that convey information about the game to the player in an understandable manner. Not only that, but they can be used to evoke strong feelings or thoughts based on the information that they communicate. The audio and visuals are powerful tools that when used with skill, can greatly improve the entertainment value of a game.